to Something for the Turbo, the new weekly podcast brought to you by Unfound, the global platform for the travel-loving cyclist. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a good week and getting out on the bike as well. Thank you very much for listening. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do subscribe, leave a review and tell all your cycling friends. If you're new to the podcast, make sure you do check out some of our historical episodes as well. We've been very lucky to have some fascinating conversations with cycling personalities from around the world. So have a look back, download listen and enjoy and make sure you tell all your friends. Today's episode is supported by our good friends Alp Cycles. They're now taking bookings for 2021 so get in touch with them for all your alpine cycling experiences. We're actually off to Scandinavia today as I'm delighted to be joined by Hans Fletzed Jensen. Hans is the founder of Oslo Dawn Patrol which is a twice weekly community ride that started with just himself and has grown to have over 300 riders join them with rides of up to 75 people on a weekly basis. The interesting thing about what Hans has done is he's created a community event that has knocked down traditional road cycling barriers. It's it's a social event that's for all abilities ranging from ex-pros and pros and elite riders to newcomers. They split the groups up now for various different abilities, but what they've maintained is a a collaborative collective that's all come together to enjoy a coffee before work twice a week post-ride. Anyway, I've kind of hashed that a little bit and I'll let Hans talk you through it in a lot more depth and with far more clarity than myself. So let's crack on with the conversation and let me bring you Hans. Good morning, Hans. Thanks for joining us. How are you getting on? You all good? Yes, thanks very much. Uh, It's been, it's great being here and uh, looking forward to to have have a chat with you. So, so thanks for inviting me. Oh, thanks for joining us. It's, I've been looking on, on Instagram. I see that you've been surviving lockdown, but you've also been on holiday back to, to Denmark. That's that looks true. amazing. That's true. I mean, uh, as you know, I, I, I live in Norway, but I, but I am, uh, I am Danish, Danish. Every summer, we we spend about three weeks in Denmark. So, so this year we were lucky that we actually, despite lockdown and closed borders and everything, we actually went through with the holiday that we had had planned already back in back before Christmas. So yeah. the border between Norway and Denmark opened quite early on. So so that was great. I had a great time there. Did you get the ferry over? Did you make that up? Yeah, we, we took the ferry over uh, and then uh, we did a bit of a tour in Denmark, you know, visiting some families and then spent two weeks uh, not just outside Copenhagen and then we took the car through Sweden on the way back. But uh, we, we ha- Sweden is, is one of the countries that where, where the border is actually closed or was at the time. So we had to, you know, just go straight through in order to avoid uh, a quarantine when we get back to Norway. Oh, uh, you couldn't stop at all? You just have to get uh, straight through We could through stop, there. but we had to hold our breath, basically. <laughs> no, okay, yeah. Okay. Stuff, but we couldn't uh, you, you cannot uh, stay overnight yeah of course of course so i think you the tour is due to to start in denmark next year isn't it it is or it was i would yeah. say because uh now they have announced that they move it uh, a week and then there's going to be a clash with the european soccer championship that's gonna they are gonna have four or five matches in copenhagen as well and that's gonna be the same same week so so i think it will actually be postponed to 2022 uh, oh right okay yeah. and i think that's the best for for everyone because uh, having the euro and the tour de france at the same time that's uh, it's gonna be too much yeah too many people and i think that um Actually, England were playing in Copenhagen, weren't they? So you probably don't want the English football fans <laughs> with, with smoking fans. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I saw some of the, the roads, though. You rode some of the roads that would be included in the Tour de France bit next year or the year after. They look magnificent. Tell us about a little bit about some of the cycling around Copenhagen. So the region that is cycling around Copenhagen is basically like cycling around many big cities. You have some stretches where you have to get out of the city but when, when you get out get out there you have some some quite nice uh, roads and so i have to say it's, it's seven years since i lived in copenhagen actually so things always change in terms of how the traffic behave and things like that but cycling around copenhagen is good and especially also inside copenhagen so copenhagen is uh, is one of the best cities for cycling in the world so there's a yeah. very very good infrastructure for cycling uh, both as a yeah. mean of transportation i mean you see i always say that when you ride to work you do that in your suit uh, and with a coffee in your hand uh, you you don't have to to change into to lycra and take a shower and all that kind of stuff afterwards uh, and that's how people ride their bike in copenhagen uh, commuting is commuting uh, and then there's a, the t- those like us who who go out for a training ride but yeah. we ride together in the infrastructure in the city and there's a there's enough space for all of us so the infrastructure is really 
really good. It's easy to get out of out of town. And had, were you were you brought up in Copenhagen? Has that always has Copenhagen always been a cycling city? Has it always had the road infrastructure in place, or this when when did this happen? I think this happened. Uh, I didn't grow up in Copenhagen. I, I went there when I was about I moved to Copenhagen when I was about twenty twenty one when I started uh, university. So so and then I stayed there in the city from from around two thousand to 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 and then for the next. Uh, what, when did I leave? 2013. So 13 years in Copenhagen. The whole cycling uh, infrastructure uh, focus, I think, started back in the 70s. Uh, so it's been a long process. So so they have basically bike secure bike lanes, separate separate bike lanes everywhere, uh, and you have so many bike bicycles. And the rush hour in Copenhagen is focused on cycling and not the cars. Basically, you see so many bikes. Uh, it's it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. it's one of the things that I miss here in Oslo, to be honest. But it's growing here as well. It's getting better. Really, the infrastructure is getting better in Oslo. It is. It is. Just for the seven years that I've been here, they've built a lot of infrastructure for cycling, uh, and you see more and more people riding their bikes all year. Not just people like me who want to go out on long training rides, but actually people who commute to work also shorter distances. So, so that's that's really good to see. And people also ride bikes as well. With their kids I've, and so on. I've seen some of your photos of the winter. Again, I mean, it's pretty cold in in December, right? <laughs> January, February. I mean. <laughs> you must be wrapping up warm. Yeah, yeah, it can get co- it can get cold. I mean, uh, I think the coldest uh, I've done is minus uh, sixteen or seventeen degrees. That's cold. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, it's actually a matter of clothing. Uh, so you make sure you have uh, woolen base layers and overshoes and covers for your and gloves. Gloves is the most important thing because if you freeze on your fingers and if they get cold, you're never gonna get warm again, uh, and then you have trouble, you know, breaking and shifting gears and things like that and then we use uh, started tires so we actually have uh, spikes metal small needles or whatever i don't know what you say it's spikes and started tires that's what we call it that makes it uh, safe on on icy road it's, what, it's kind, what kind of wet tires are they, are they hands are, they, are you on a, are you on like a cross bike or what, yeah. what are you riding yeah. usually uh, yeah. and, and during winter time it's a it's a it's a cross bike or gravel bike or mountain bike so yeah, i would say at least a 35 millimeter tire uh, and then yeah. with, with starts then you're good to go okay and and going back to so for me i i know that everyone says there's no such thing as bad weather it's you're not dressed right i, I don't mind riding in the cold but you're right hands having cold hands is just the worst what, <laughs> what gloves as an expert of cold weather riding what gloves are you you wearing at the moment well, I usually have uh, what you call lobster gloves. So, so these thick gloves with just a, a finger for your thumb and then two. So you have basically pair your, your, your I don't know what you call it, but two, two of your fingers together. So you kind of stay warmer. So you don't have just five, a five finger glove, if you know what I mean. So you have basically a lobster hand and it looks a little bit uh, strange, uh, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's what you need if it's uh, below uh, minus five, six degrees, I'd say. Celsius. Well, below five degrees for me. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit soft. Um, okay, <laughs> cool. Well, you have to have to send me a link and I'll put them in the show notes for anyone interested in. I'll do that. I'll problems. do. Yeah. Um, so we've gone off on a bit of a random tangent, but why, why don't we go back a little bit and, and tell, tell us a little bit about your cycling background and when you started riding and, and what have you done some racing and, and tell us a little bit about yourself. So I started cycling as a, as a kind of as, as a sport when I was a teenager, when I was around 14, I think that's, that was back in the mid nineties and what happened is, as, I, as I, I've been thinking about this because I knew you, you'd ask, what happened is uh, I was living at home uh, as, as a kid here. And then I, one of the neighbors did this race in Denmark from Aarhus to Copenhagen, two of the big cities in Denmark. And that was a total distance of 359 kilometers, the longest race wow. in Denmark at the time, I think. And I was is it still uh, going? Sorry? Is it still going? Yes. Uh, it's been down for a few years, but it's actually back, I think. Wow. Interesting. It's been a bit on and off for the last 10 years, I uh, think. But there was a 10, 15 years back in the 90s where they did quite consistently every year. And I was just a kid and I just saw this and thought that that looks great. And then I had just, you know, managed to save enough money for, for a road bike. Uh, so I had just went to a, to a random bike shop and bought a road bike. And then uh, basically I just signed up for this race. And I was I was 15 at the time when I did it. And I hadn't done any, basically any cycling before that. I had went out for a few. I had bought a pair of cycling shoes, I think. I'm not sure, but I think I had. And I also bought a, a pair of cycling shorts. And then from there, it was a T-shirt. Uh, and then I was just, you know, on the bike and went out for a 359-kilometer ride. I love that. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. It's the kind of thing where I always, always tell people not to do. 
because it, you, if you want to start cycling and you do something like that, you just break your neck. But that's exactly, I, I just did it. <laughs> and it took forever. It took maybe 24 hours to, to make it all the way through. And I had my parents following me all the way in, oh, in the car really, and things like oh, that. Great parental support. Wow. Great parental support, yeah. But it yeah. was fun. Uh, and I actually did it a few, uh, since then. I started, uh, joined a club and, and did quite a bit of racing, started racing as a, as a junior. Uh, and I think I raced for maybe four, Five years until the first or second year as a what do you call the level after you when you're kind of grown up not senior senior to me sounds like old people but when you're done with the junior junior riding then you I, I did and I had this dream of becoming a professional of course I trained a lot I think I, I did hardly anything but riding my bike and going to school but you know then I think that must have been 99 98 99 I just you know got enough and I just stopped completely sold my bike and everything and uh, went to to uni I took uh, took an education instead and kind of skipped the dream of becoming a professional yeah. and i've never never regretted that uh, because i obviously didn't have the the talent for that not at all uh, yeah. and i think uh, I'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I, I i chose that path in life instead yeah. um and then eight years later when i was living in australia i walked by a bike shop and uh, saw a, a road bike there and i bought that one and started riding again down there the weather was nice and so on i was living in melbourne and then oh. um, I started then, and then since then I've been riding at a, a bit competitive for the first year, a few years in Denmark. Uh, then when I since I moved to Norway in 2013, it's been more a matter of stay uh, exercise, keeping you know mental health, and you know just getting out there, meeting people, and so on. So, yeah. so that's kind of my uh, my cycling my cycling story. And a bit of cross, I see you've done a bit, you dip your toe into a bit of cross every now and again. I do, I do a bit of, I mean. That's something that started maybe here in Norway four or five years ago. They have a few yeah. quite good cross races here in the Oslo area. And I just you know, started joining some of them. And I'm, I'm just getting my ass kicked very hard. But it's fun. It's really fun. And then, of course, gravel riding is just growing. And here in Oslo, we have some fantastic region areas for, for gravel riding. So, so that is obviously something I do as well. But at the core, I will always be a road cyclist. Yeah. I, did, I did quite a bit on the, on the track when I was back in the 90s as well, actually. And that, that's something I miss as well. They don't have a track here in Oslo, but they're building one now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Well, we, we had Dan Bingham on a couple of weeks ago. And obviously, he's working with the, the Danish uh, pursuit team. And uh, my word, they're having some success at the moment, aren't they? They are. They are definitely. And I think track racing in general in Denmark has has brought about a lot of talent. Oh. And people tend to say that, what is it with track racing? It's boring and it's just, you know, riding your bike. But first of all, it's not boring at all. It's super fun. And secondly, it's, yeah. it's, it's incredibly good training. And then also technically technically you are becoming a much better cyclist by riding the track and uh, so so i think track for track riding on the velodrome is is just making you a better cyclist on the road as well yeah or, or the gravel yeah, or the cross wherever you are right whatever yeah yeah exactly exactly now tell me oslo i obviously want to get on to oslo dawn patrol and and what you've done there which is absolutely incredible but for those listening that, that may not have seen your your rides and we'll put all your your strava details and instagram links in, in the show notes but Oslo looks an incredible place to ride on the road, some spectacular scenery, a very easy place to get out of the city and ride to, but but also amazing gravel as well. I saw the, the recent it, Oslo Gravel Crusher look like an, a just breathtaking event. Yeah, so, so exactly. I mean, Oslo is a, is a it's, it's the capital of Norway, but it's actually Norway is a, uh, is a is a big country geographically, but we're not that many people. So so it's it's a fairly small city, uh, less yeah. than a, less than a million people. So that means that oh, wow. the distance to get out of town is out of town isn't really that big. And that's that's of course great that you can do that that you don't have to spend 2 hours riding through the traffic. So I would say 20 minutes you're out of town and 30 minutes you're out in the middle of nowhere especially if you go on the gravel gravel uh, roads then you are literally in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere and that's that's quite unique that you can do that you can i live in the city center basically right next to the central station and half an hour riding i'm out in the middle of nowhere i think that's 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 fantastic uh, and and the good thing is that you have it's quite you can go if you, if you want to go gravel, you can get some serious climbing, uh, some really steep hills, uh, steep climbs. Uh, but you can also find go a bit in the other direction, stay on the road and more like rolling hills. I've heard people referring to it as the Norwegian Toscana. Uh, I think that might be... Uh, 
offending to Toscana, but I don't know. Uh, but but it, it's a great area, and uh, as you say, I mean, uh, <laughs> I always try to you know post a few photos here and there, and uh, especially if the sun is out, it it, it always looks good. It, it does. Yeah, it does look good. Yeah, and you've got that big loop as well where you get the ferry over. What, what tell us about that one? I've seen that a few times. Yeah, there's a there's a loop. <laughs> that's another one where they actually say that we go to Oslo's version of Staten Island. Uh, again, the Norwegians like to think that they, they that Norway is uh, is the best place on the planet, and to a large extent it is. But Staten Island, I think we should uh, leave that for New York. But there is this loop where you go out. Uh, it's a I think it's 60, 70 kilometers, and you go out of town, and then you go back, and then you have you go out on this kind of peninsula back towards the city but then you have to take a 20 minute ferry back to town yeah. that's a that's a lovely one because you it's a 60 six, 70 kilometers uh, you can do that in a decent time and then you have 20 minutes on the ferry for for a coffee so you actually have a coffee stop there while you're being taken back to town so that's a good one sounds like my kind of right and you mentioned the, yeah. gra- the gravel it's actually called the also gravel grinder and gravel grinder I yeah that. so, so that was a, yeah. it was a ride an event i joined this year it was the first time they organized it and it came about, I think, because because of the lockdown and all the restrictions on organizing events, the, the number of people you can be and the racing and things like that, all the restrictions that they have. So what they did is that these people that I know them fairly well, to be honest, but they w- went about and said, OK, let's do a gravel grinder where people sign up. Uh, they pay a fee. They don't get a start. No, they don't, don't get any number and we don't have any timekeeping, but we do have some three or I think it was three spots, three checkpoints uh, that we had to pass. Right. And then we got the GPS file. So every every participant got a GPS file. Uh, and then there was a lunch stop where they provided us a good uh, substantial lunch and a dinner stop with a good substantial dinner. And in total, it was 260 kilometers with about 6,000 6, meters of elevation and, and, and a lot of that was on gravel as well am i right in saying all of it basically 95 of, of it 95 percent was on gravel because we went out in this area called normarka outside oslo which is a yeah. national park it's huge and there's a lot of gravel ride gravel roads out there closed for traffic so most of the ride was out there and uh, i'd say six thousand meters of elevation is a lot on gravel and some of these climbs are so a steep yeah, well, it was fantastic. Uh, I really hope they'll do it again next year. Yeah, I was going to say, say they, 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 gonna... say they will. Yeah, will they? Fantastic. Because I've seen, obviously, your photos and, and ride you posted, but I've seen some fantastic videos as well going around other event. event. It looked mm. magnificent. I'd love to know if they're going to do it again next year, because mm. I'm sure there'll be mm. people interested from all over. It looks, looks mm. magnificent. Quite a diverse uh, array of terrain as well. It, it's not all very, it's quite different, isn't it? Some water and some sort of more pineland, and it's, it's really quite a diverse array. It is, it is. I think most of the roads uh, grab roads are you kind of countryside roads gravel countryside roads but they are closed because it's a it's a national park so you you, you need a permit to actually go in and so, so very very few cars get out there so you have those roads for yourself so but then in addition to that you have all the small small single tracks and paths that you can take here and there and if you know the area well you can just keep going forever so it's it's absolutely if i'd say oslo as a cycling destination would definitely be mainly because of the easy access to gravel i think you are in the city and you have extremely easy access to to gravel yeah so it's, it's somewhere you could come and do a weekend maybe a couple yeah, of days riding yeah, yeah, stay in the city yeah. and get a bit of culture as well mm, yeah. and is what about bike packing is that is that growing in in oslo and in norway and is that something that's readily yeah. available on the doorstep it's not something that I do much myself, to be honest, but you see it a lot. A lot of people go go bike packing, and several of my friends have been doing this in Norway uh, from north to south, uh, all the way from North really? Cape, north Cape uh, at the very top, uh, and all the yeah. way down. I think that's maybe two and a half thousand kilometers. Uh, so that's a long ride, uh, fantastic one. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, there are several of people going bike bike packing all the time. So as, as I think that's just not. Not only for Norway, I think that's just, you know, the way cycling is, is developing these years. It's, it's moving more and more into, you could say, adventure. Yeah. What, what do you think is driving that? It's driving that because uh, more and more people want to ride their bicycle. But, you know, racing is still requires so much training and focus on a training program and intervals. And then also you need to actually go travel to the races. That's one of the reasons that I don't race anymore. It takes too much time. 
and planning yeah. uh, and yeah. and logistics. One thing is the training. I've 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 never been good at actually following a training program and you know doing my intervals and, and things like that. It's it's not what drives me when when on the bike. I, I basically I want to ride my bicycle. I want to I want to train and I want to be fairly strong and, and fit. But I don't want it to be dictated by a training program saying today you have to do those intervals, those five minutes or whatever. Uh, the, f- f- I think for a lot of people that's a barrier. But when you can do these adventure things, these adventure going bikepacking, going riding gravel, just you know, I think that it's it's much more easy for people to to actually start doing that. Yeah, interesting. I, I think I mean I think even if you are doing the the intervals, it's very easy to become beholden to them. Mm-hmm. So maybe sort of breaking off the shackles and going on sort of bikepacking adventures is quite liberating even mm-hmm. for those that have been racing for a number mm-hmm. of years mm-hmm. yeah. that's right that's right so Hans one of the things that I've I've watched from afar both both in in Hong Kong and since I've moved back to the UK is, is just the establishment and then the incredible growth and success of the Oslo Dawn Patrol which is obviously your baby something you've set up <laughs> for those listening that aren't familiar with it tell us a little bit about what it is and how it came about and how you got the idea and yeah tell us a little bit more about it so Oslo Dawn Patrol is, uh, as, as you say, it's, it's 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 something that I have. We've been riding that for two years now, uh, almost two years. And what it is is, it's a weekly early morning ride uh, where we meet 5:40 a.m. in the morning, and we go for a 90-minute ride, about 40 kilometers, and then we uh, have coffee at a uh, local cafe, and then we go to work or whatever we do. So it's a weekly morning event, and I started that. I've always been a fan of getting out out of bed early to ride my bike uh, because it you know it frees up time in the afternoon, and when you're a morning person, uh, that that works quite well. And I've yeah, been doing amazing. that for for years, and basically most of the time I've always been alone. And then uh, about a few years ago, I started just you know organizing it, and people just started joining. And and the funny thing is the name also Dawn Patrol. I think it's quite catchy. And I actually yeah. got the idea. To to that name on on the unfound hub because I, I think I left a post about a morning ride and then someone commented yeah the dawn patrol is always the best and that's kind of where I said ah or oh, dawn patrol that sounds cool or whatever at least at, I know that the next morning ride I did I called Oslo Dawn Patrol oh there you go uh, yeah yeah and then you go so so a, a lot of it is down to to coincidence you could say I had a few friends joining and then we started and then we started just doing the same route and, and it was me driving it I started you know saying I'm going out I'm doing the same route as last Tuesday are you joining and then they joined again and then i started you know creating a- events on facebook uh, posting about it in social media in general and then people started joining and i think the most we've been is, is 70 people and getting 70 people out of bed before uh, around five o'clock in the morning to ride their bike is, is quite impressive i think and amazing so you've, you've gone from nothing to 70 people in, in just a couple of years and, yeah, and I, 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 said, I, one I, thing is 70 have... people uh, joining one ride but there has been i think uh, about 300 people has been through the the the, the system has has been has joined one, at least one ride. I've created this Facebook group where if you've joined a, a, just at least one Oslo Dawn Patrol ride, you can get access to that Facebook group. And, and we are close to 300 members in there now. Uh, so it, it's it's getting quite well known in the cycling uh, community in Oslo and in Norway. Uh, so, yeah. so that's uh, that's fantastic, I'd say. So now... Yeah, it's brilliant. You've been having to... You've actually had a bit of a headache with regards just to the numbers getting so big. You've had yeah. to do different speed groups and stuff, haven't you? Yeah, that that's the challenge. <laughs> the, the challenge of, of your own success, you could say. But, uh, but that's a luxury problem. So, you know, when more and more people join, the groups get bigger and bigger. And that's obviously a challenge. We're lucky that we don't have that much traffic and we're yeah, early in the yeah. morning so so riding in a big group is actually okay uh, yeah the challenge that 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 i've seen is that people obviously are of different levels we have we've had a we've had a pros joining a few times uh, and we've had people riding the first ride ever in a group joining so you know there's a big there's a big difference uh, in level on how skilled uh, experienced people are and what kind of level of fitness they're in uh, yeah. so, so what we are doing now is that I'm, i've started organizing these i don't want to call them beginner editions actually I, I i've been struggling about what to call them because a beginner edition kind of say okay you need to be a beginner to join that right but what we actually just do is we write slower so so yeah. now uh, we we have this once a 
we write twice a week now, actually, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, after the corona, I've had to set some limitations on how many people we can be in each group. So, so from now on, we are up to 25 in each group. So on Tuesdays, tomorrow morning, we are going out two groups of 25 each. And we'll do the same on Thursday. And one of the groups on Thursday, we have dedicated to be at a maximum of 25 kilometers per hour as an, at an average. Okay. And that is attracting yeah. a lot of people because I get a lot of messages from people asking, will you do rides for those of us who aren't so comfortable in riding in a big group or uh, at a at fairly fast, high, high speed? A pace. The pace is, is 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 getting higher and higher because we have some incredibly strong people joining. Oh. And they want to they oh, want race. And, and so the challenge when you get numbers like that is really ensuring that it's an enjoyable social ride for for all abilities, given you got racers and 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 newbies as well. True, true. And uh, and you know I, I think that that's one of the things that I think is re- is really really great about Oslo Dawn Patrol is that it attracts a lot of people of different kind different kinds of people. And I really like to see more people going out cycling. Uh, and apparently, something like Oslo Dawn Patrol attracts people who want to start cycling as well or who want to join a ride uh, one way or the other. So, yeah. so these, uh, I would case call softer editions or beginner rides or uh, lower pace or whatever, those are the ones where we see new people joining. And then, you know, as long as then they get into the routine and then they figure out, okay, I can actually easily join the, the faster groups as well. And then, then, then they're, they're hooked, you could say. It just helps build confidence. I mean, I think one of the amazing things you've done is that I know, I think sometimes unfairly road cycling has a, has a bad reputation with regards to, to cliques and barriers and, and difficult to, to start in the sport. But I think one of the things that you've done so well with Oslo Dawn Patrol is to bring in such an array of abilities um, from pro riders to absolute beginners in a in a real sort of inclusive uh, relaxed and social environment and I think that's probably testament to, to you and, and your approach and love of cycling. Yeah I mean what I'm quite focused on is that it, it has to be to be an inclusive event. I want this one to be open to everyone and I mean yes there's been pro riders but let's be honest there's just been one and he actually stopped his career ended his career after afterwards so it's not that we see pro riders every week at all definitely not but we do see some very very strong riders and, yeah. but, but we, we as long as I can keep, you know, making something that attracts uh, the whole array of, as you say, of, of those newbies and people who, who don't ride that much, uh, women as well. That's one of the things that are also in the diversity element that we can actually have, have women included in this. Uh, I, I, I usually say that uh, cycling for women can easily, women and men can easily ride together. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's, it's not that you have to organize specific women, women's rides. That's a great thing to do, and it attracts a lot of women into cycling. But you can also have the combination, and that's 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 what I try to do to make sure that that I include as many different kind of cyclists uh, as much as possible. Yeah, no, it's nice, and it's something that I've, I've been always very passionate about. Is that you don't need all these cliques and barriers, and actually everyone can ride together. If, it, if it's a coffee, if it's a coffee roll on a Wednesday, it doesn't matter. You can, it's, it's an inclusive thing and a great chance to connect and meet with new people and exchange ideas. And you know, one yeah, of the things. What, that, that is exactly one, one of the, the, the social element. What I see from Oslo Dawn Patrol is that I, I see a lot of connections being made there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I see people joining a ride and then I, I can see, okay, they are actually connecting and then they're organizing their own rides and things like that. So people actually make, make friends and connections there. Uh, I actually think that there are a few that are actually hooked up uh, as well. So, so that's just great uh, yeah. <laughs> but what, what what i always i'm, I'm very focused on I'm, i mean we all know that or that there are all these kind of rules on how to look on your bike and you need to, to have to shave my legs and what the socks and all those kinds of things and i have yeah. to admit i want when i ride my bike I, I follow most of these rules but it's yeah. not that i care about someone not doing it if people yes. want to look People can look like they want on the bike as long as they get out on the bike. That that's yes. what that's what matters to me. And I think that's one of the st- things that cycling in general struggle with is the inclusive, being inclusive to those who might not know all those unwritten rules or might not yeah. want to follow them or might not have the money for it. Yeah. Or the time or whatever it is. We we all still want to go cycling. And when we sit at the cafe and drink coffee and chat, it doesn't matter at all. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. I think that that's great. And what was this what was the sort of driving secret to the success that, that you had? Was it that kind of open attitude combined with the fact that 
you've ensured the consistency week in week out that it, that's happened what, what, what are the secrets i think the secret is uh, you, you you mentioned consistency i've i've kind of identified three things that i think is the, the, the key elements of of this being quite successful and and the first thing is the predictability what we do is that we we do the same every week we yeah. meet at the same time uh, the yeah. same place and we ride the same route at yeah. more or less the same pace and we do that every week and we end up at the same coffee shop uh, so so everything is the same so yeah. the the barrier to getting out of bed early to join a ride is is lower because you know what you get and it's easier to tell someone else about it it's yeah. not like when you go for a ride you don't have to worry about will there be a long climb today or are we going in the wrong direction of compared to where i need to be afterwards you know what you get so so i think that's especially on a morning ride have as few decisions you need to make in the morning uh, yeah. before going make out just fun. get up get dressed and get out that that's what you need to do so that's yeah. the predictability the second one is consistency that you just do it again and again and again. So when I started this, I started alone. And second time I was alone. And then a few people started joining and a few few more and a few more. And then it, it starts growing. And people know that we ride every Tuesday and we do it all year, no matter yeah. what the weather is. Yeah, I've seen the snow photos. I can, I can <laughs> vouch for that. <laughs> I mean, those, those rides where we are in, you know, in minus 10, 15 degrees and we have snow and things like that, they are, they are tough and we, we aren't that many people, to be, to be fair. But we still see 10, 15 people showing up at yeah, that time brilliant. of the year as well. So that's yeah. the consistency that you don't have to worry about, will there be a ride or not? There will be a ride, full stop. Yeah. And then this, the, the last thing is that, that someone, you, you need the passion. And I think that comes down to, to, to the organizer. I have the passion for cycling, but I also yeah. have the passion for actually organizing something. Yeah. You know, taking leadership of this is, is something I, I cannot deny that I, I enjoy building this and, and being, being able to actually lead this group and, and making more people go out riding, seeing people connecting and so on. That, that's kind of what, what drives me. And I have the passion for all that, including the actual riding the bike and the cycling as well. So those are the things that you need uh, to, to, to do it. Get it working. Yeah. And for those of you listening that know me, I, I think that they will vouch for the fact that, that I resonate with all those points and uh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so so Han, what, what, what's, what's the plan with Oslo Dawn Patrol now? Are you going to grow? I mean, numbers you probably can't grow many more, can you? But in terms of uh, other other cities, or is there going to be Oslo Dawn Patrol tours, or and for anyone listening that's going to be on holiday or and uh, or or traveling, or oh, travel's a bit a bit slow at the moment, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. let's hope it comes back. Also, yeah, exactly. On business, are they able to sort of drop in and, and join one of these rides? Obviously, always, uh, and and we've had a few of them. Uh, you know people passing through uh, and, and joining. Uh, so people are always welcome to join. That, that's, uh, that's, that's obvious. Expanding to other cities, uh, that happens already. I'm, I think I, I've had uh, quite a few people over the last year or so reaching out to me, asking if it was okay for them to organize a Dawn Patrol in, in their city. So we've seen Dawn Patrols in Barcelona, in Warsaw, in Poland, in, uh, in Copenhagen as well. And then Brilliant. also a few places here in Norway, in, in Bergen and in Tønsberg, Arndal and so on. So there are places in Norway and then most recently also in, in Kiel in Germany. And, and especially Kiel, I would say they are, they seem to be quite successful because I also think Kiel has the kind of the size of this, uh, the, the community and the, 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 the area and things like that. So they have a good culture for cycling so so they are actually quite successful down there so if you if you are in the kiel area in german northern germany you should go to kiel dawn patrol, uh, dawn patrol. And, and all these dawn patrols they're, they're on facebook are they or is there a website what's the easiest way to find them i don't know it's, it's a bit different most of them i think have groups on facebook or uh, instagram profiles i i don't i to be honest i don't I don't. I don't want to control it. People ask me if they can call it Dawn Patrol, and I say yes. I have. I've registered the trademark Oslo Dawn Patrol. Uh, okay, cool. And, and and to some extent, I have also the trademark rights for Dawn Patrol when it comes to a cycling event. But at the end of the day, I cannot control if people want to go out riding, do a group riding in the morning. Yeah, so, so I don't. I don't want to. I'm. I'm always really appreciate that people ask me uh, and. To some extent, give me some credit for for the work that I that I've managed to, that I've done by building this in Oslo. If it spreads out, that's just great. I'm I'm sure it, it will just bring more bring more people out on their bike. That's fantastic. So what will what where do I want to go with Oslo Dawn Patrol? <laughs> Numbers keep growing, uh, and I think they 
can continue to that. We've, we've obviously, because of Corona, we've had to limit the number of people that we can take in. I've had to set up a booking system where people actually register with name and contact details wow. uh, because before Corona was just, you know, a Facebook event and people could just join. Uh, you, there was no con- kind of control on who, who joined. But I need that now because when I organize an event, I need to know who's there. So the authorities, if there's a, if there's a new uh, virus breakout or something, uh, they, they need to be able to, to track down the virus uh, and contact people. So that's why I need to be more strict on who who's actually joining, and also try to split into more groups. But it, it works it works really well, and and I think you shouldn't underestimate that uh, that we will start writing every morning one day that there will be enough people for that. I've had to to engage uh, a number of additional road captains, so I have uh, five uh, five people who actually uh, I. I simply just uh, you know made a post and said i need more road captains who who want to help driving this because i can't yeah. do this alone uh, first of all i also have a family and other obligations so i can't commit to being there every tuesday and thursday all year yeah. so i need yeah, people yeah. to to be able to rely on so we have a very good group there of, of six people now that we we share ideas and they help me in in in, in keeping this going and driving this so so that is uh, that is fantastic so so big shout out to to them and thanks for that and um i also I have this thing that I call Oslo Cycling Project. That's kind of my, the, you could say, the project that it, that it all started out with, that I wanted to do something with cycling. So Oslo Cycling Project is a Facebook page that I have, and then I organize different kind of cycling event group rides mainly. Uh, so I also do rides that aren't Oslo Dawn Patrol, but are just a normal group ride uh, in the afternoon or Saturday. And we have this in the midsummer where we ride yes. until late in the night uh, on the well, longest day of the year. This is the top of my list to ask you, Hans. Yeah, it should be. When, when, when I moved back to Europe, there were, there were two places, well, a number, many, many places that I want to go ride. But, but midsummer in, in Oslo was, was right up the top of my list. And obviously, sadly, we, I couldn't do that this year. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about your, your midsummer's ride and how that works and, and the beers afterwards. So, so the thing with midsummer is that one of the things that are so fantastic about Scandinavia in the summertime is that we have so much daylight. And what I've done, I think, yeah, this year was the third time I did it. I organized this, what I call a midsummer patrol. Uh, I kind of stick to the name patrol for all the rides that I organize to, to, to keep some sort of structure in it. So we have this midsummer patrol. And what I do is I, I set up, a, I prepare a route about 150 kilometers, and then we meet at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And then okay. we he- head out for, for five to seven hours on the bike. Uh, that means that we are back in the city around midnight. And, and, and is it still light? Is it still it light is, at midnight? Exactly. Is it? That, that's a great thing. Oh, it's, it's actually, you do, you do need to bring lights on your bike because it's getting darker. You are, of course, the sun sets around 11.15 or 11.30 or something. Really? That's yeah. amazing. So, so it, it will get darker but nothing where you, you can't ride your bike you, you just need a small flash to be seen yeah uh, so so what and and this year <laughs> in june we had fantastic weather around 30 degrees uh, it was just awesome and then we headed back into a to a bar in the city where we could sit outdoor and uh, en- enjoy a, a beer afterwards and so i had 50 people 45 people joining this year and most of the, at least half of them joined for for beers afterwards and that's again about the, the social element that we do we do some serious cycling but we also do some serious socializing you could say cycling is important but just as important is the fact that we can actually relax and uh, socialize afterwards yeah oh exactly it's, it's the whole package isn't it see the world on the bike and then enjoy it over a drink yeah that's cool that's that's right right at the top of my top of my list and what, what other events have you got in the pipeline obviously quite difficult to plan at the moment given everything that's going on but it is other- it is yeah. What, uh, what, so, so what, what I do is I I try to have some rides in the calendar that I want to plan like the uh, the midsummer and do something during the fall and the winter. Some simply some cycling uh, where we go out cycling and do some socializing. I'm also now in in late August uh, doing a, a ride with a, with a Danish adventure cyclist called Christian Ori, uh, who who is who's made a film about gravel riding in Denmark, uh, and he's coming to Oslo to to present this movie and and do a screening of that film, and we are doing yeah. a social ride gravel right before that and then we will meet and 
watch the film together and he'll tell us about it. So that's, uh, I think it's on August 28th. So if you're in, in the Oslo uh, region, then you should uh, you should join us. But again, we had to put limits on how many people we can have because of oh, really? COVID-19, yeah. because we cannot just open it up for, for 100 people or 50 or whatever. So we, everything has to be a little bit restricted. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that's kind of the, the condition. That that's, that's the way it is right now. And everybody understands it. So so that's that's how it is. Yeah. It's a bit unprecedented, is it? I think everyone's probably yeah. quite sympathetic yeah. for that. But I suppose it increased demand if you've only got a certain amount of people that can come along to, <laughs> to watch it. I've seen the trailer of that that film and it looks spectacular. And, and you're going to kindly let us all know when when it's on more general release, aren't you? I will. I will. I'll definitely make sure that I, that I share information on that because I haven't seen the film, but I've seen the trailer and uh, it, it looks uh, it looks good. Really, really good. It looks wicked, yeah. Cool. And tell me, I've I've been very envious of of your steeds of late. You're you're on. Is it Dare bikes? So they 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 work with you, or you work with them? What's what's the deal there? So the deal with Dare is that uh, that I have uh, managed uh, to to at the age of um, forty plus to actually get a sponsor. I think, uh, and I think that's uh, uh, that that's what the dream I had when I was a teenager. I wanted to become a professional. I, I managed to fulfill that uh, twenty five years later. So what happened here is that I have a good deal with Dare bikes uh, here in Norway, and uh, they approached me last year uh, because of. The success that I had had with Oslo Dawn Patrol, and asked if 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 I wanted to be uh, an ambassador for their bikes, and I think if, for me it was kind of a no-brainer because uh, it gave me the opportunity to to uh, to get bikes, both gravel and road, get new new bikes. I I borrow, I have to return them, I borrow them and ride them, uh, and I have a contract with them for for a couple of years where they where I ride their bikes and. Uh, it's it, when they approached me, I was like, I, I told them, okay, uh, you do know that I'm just a normal middle-aged man uh, who who are slightly uninterested in all the technical aspects of a bicycle because I'm not that I'm I'm not a tech. Uh, I don't know so much about the mechanics on a bicycle. I don't. I, yeah, I really don't exactly. like to main. I don't like to maintain my bike. If I can get someone to do it, I'll pay them for it. Uh, and I said, you know, I I I I don't know much about bikes. I would. I just want a bike that's good, up to date, and looks good. And they said, yeah, yeah but that that's exactly the kind of. <laughs> ambassador that we want yeah, because so, yeah. mo- most people are actually like that uh, yeah. a lot of people who want to start riding bicycle or who are riding already they don't know so much about what kind of bike they're riding and all yeah. the details they do know it's a carbon bike they know the brand they might even know what wheel set they are having but from there very few people actually know much and i get obviously get a lot of questions about the bike uh, and i always I'm always very transparent on the fact that that I'm an ambassador, so so I have a contractual relation. But I always say that it's it's a very very good bike, and I I, I can honestly say that it I it, it is a good bike. But I also get detailed questions about what kind of gearing, uh, what kind of wheel set, what kind of tires, and I always have to go and check when people ask me these questions because I can't remember. I always have to check what gearing is it, and that's because I'm not super interested in that. Uh, yeah. I, uh, okay. I, I want a bike that that's good, and it's it's working, and don't make any noises, and uh, you know, it just has to be good. Uh, yeah, and it is. fair. I love the honesty. But what, what can you tell us a little bit about Dare as as a as a brand, though? I mean, where, where are they based? Where are they from? What kind of bikes they do? Have you got have you got that much information to hand? I have, I have, of course. Yeah. So so Dare is a is a Taiwanese brand. Uh, it comes from Taiwan. The, here in Norway, the, the distributorship or the we could say the right to sell their bikes in Europe is is with the Uno X. Uh, Uno X is a company here in Norway, uh, an energy company that also has a professional cycling team. So they oh, have. Yeah. So they have bought the rights to their bikes uh, in Norway and and uh, in Europe. So their bikes Norway or now I think they changed name to their bikes Europe. They are the ones that I have an agreement with. Actually, I have an agreement with Uno X, which is also a professional team. So, but that's a different story. Uh, it is their bikes that I have the the, the agreement with, uh, and uh, they are based in Norway. The the pro team ride their bikes. There are a number of racing teams in Norway, and uh, I think there's there's one in Belgium, a Sec Racing in Belgium. I think they they use their bikes as well, and then they sell online, uh, and they have. Uh, three or four models for for road bikes. Uh, they uh, have a, a gravel bike, uh, and they have a TT bike, uh, and a uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, so they have a limited number of models, uh, and it's it's basically 
build your own bike online and then they ship directly. Okay. Uh, depending on where you I, I don't know so much about the logistics, but I know they built them here in Oslo at the at the service course here in Oslo. They built them at their ah, uh, mechanic yeah. there. They built them and shipped them from there, at least okay. to the region here in the Nordics. Yeah. Good. So we'll, we'll put their details in, in the notes as well. Yeah. And I, I, you mentioned service course there. They, they've opened up in, in Oslo, haven't they? Yes, they have. They opened up, uh, I think it was November. So that's the service course. You might know service course from, from Girona. They expanded out. I think they, they opened one in, in the UK as well. And then here in Norway. Uh, so they opened up in November and uh, have this, they, they have a, a shop. Or a, yeah, it's a service course. Uh, for those who know the brand, I think they would know that it's, uh, I, I call it high end. Uh, and uh, yeah. they organize, uh, we talked about gravel riding before. They organize gravel rides and gravel trips and so on. So it's interesting to see how that will succeed. It's unfortunate that they were hit by the corona lockdown and all that at, a, at an un, unfortunate time when they were just, you know, starting up and getting into their first real summer season. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I hope they will make it. It's it's interesting to see if they can, you know, create Oslo as a destin- tr- destination for people who want to go cycling, because to be honest, we don't have the climate that you have in Girona. So it's a shorter season, it would be. I it's suppose. a shorter season. The weather is more often bad. You, you you can't guarantee that the weather is good, like you can to a certain extent in in southern Europe. But I hope it, it it's cool for for the environment that there are places like service course actually opening up and and doing something uh, for cycling. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've just hired um, Simon Gerrans has just gone to the service course to be the. Yeah. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, very good. And look, I, on a number of podcasts recently, we've been talking about just you know with Corona the the challenges for pro cycling at the moment. You mentioned off air Uno X there, who who obviously got the the relationship with Dare Bikes as well. They've they've got a pro team, Pro Conti team in in out of Norway. It's quite an interesting structure. T- tell us a little bit about how they differ from a lot of sort of pro cycling teams in terms of structure. Yeah, it is. I mean, I have to be fair with you i don't know so much about it uh it's it's not that i have a, a relation as such with uno x my relation is to to their bikes but i do know that the way they structure the uno x cycling team is a bit different from from many other pro teams whereas the team is actually owned by uh, uno x the company uh, so it you, you could basically call, <laughs> might even just call it a, just another business line of business for that company it's not someone owning a cycling company which is relying on a number of sponsors they are the sponsor and they own the company as well and the riders are employed by that company so they're, i think they're a power company are they they're, they're a power company like a corporate big corporate yeah yeah exactly yeah. Uh, and and i think that gives gives them the uh, a chance of being much more long long-term perspective in their planning yeah. uh, they, they they don't have to look to the end of the season and wonder whether there will be a sponsor next year as well or yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. they they are much more in control of the whole the whole the whole process at the team uh, themselves uh, and i think as a, i think also we've seen through through lockdown and you know everything being cancelled the riders have they haven't been you know sent home on leave or or anything like that like what you've seen on other professional teams so uh, it's uh, it's interesting and i hope that it, it's it's a very good team it's a first uh, real pro team out of norway and yeah. uh, obviously it gets a lot of attention here in local media and i hope that they will uh, succeed uh, and it looks like it uh, they have yeah. some very they're signing some good riders yeah but all that being said i need to tell you i'm not that interested in pro cycling actually uh, <laughs> I don't follow. I don't spend so much time following pro cycling. I don't spend time watching uh, cycling on TV. I, 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 I honestly, I don't have the time for that. So uh, cycling, pro cycling is is cool, uh, and uh, I respect uh, these riders how fast they can ride and how strong they are and the races they do. But yeah. but I don't I don't follow it that much myself. I'm more into actually. I would rather spend the time riding myself on your bike. Yeah, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Particularly with a young family, every every minute yeah. counts. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's awesome. Now, Hans, thank you so much for taking the time to to come and have a have a chat today. We'll put all your details in in the notes if that's all right. If anyone is going to Oslo or has any questions around Dawn Patrol or or whatever any other projects within Norway, do get in touch with Hans. He's incredibly well connected there and he's doing some 
magnificent things. Have I missed anything? Have you got any other questions yourself? Is there anything that uh, we haven't covered today? We've covered quite a lot. We have. We've covered quite a lot. Obviously, I, I think the uh, the Oslo Dawn Patrol is is the uh, most important thing. That that's kind of my uh, my baby. You could say the one the one that I've been been successful so far. But I'll just say, if anyone is to know it. Do get in touch and uh, we'll go for a ride. I'm always open yeah. for that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So we'll, uh, if anyone's listening in Norway, make sure you go find Oslo Dawn Patrol and join the ever-growing community, which is absolutely awesome to see. Good work. Cheers, Hans. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. And sure. stay in touch, won't you? Let us know how you're progressing and how it's growing. And please let us know any other upcoming events that you're doing outside of Dawn Patrol so we can spread the word. I will. I will. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. You take care of yourself. Cheers, mate. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast. And more importantly, don't forget to download the Unfound app and join cyclists from around the world on the hub. We'll see you on there.